Good evening, welcome back to Poetry Love Fuzz. It is I, ZM Wise, and here I am with another home recording just for you. This is an unboxing of the Little Black Classics box set from the publisher known as Penguin. They have, to my knowledge, over 1,800 titles now, uh, an assortment of literary wonderment from fiction to nonfiction, from philosophy to history. To, from drama and maxims to my personal favorite genre, poetry. Now, I've already taken the liberty of removing the content from the box and removing the shrink wrap as well, so we could just get right down to it. I know it's totally unorthodox, I'm sorry, but hey, what are you going to do? Beautiful white exterior, all nations, colors, barbarisms, civilizations, languages. And, the, of course, there's the, the logo on top, so let's turn our, this baby around and see. Oh, look at that selection. Look at that glorious selection. There are 80 titles here in all with the aforementioned range of, of versatile literature. From here, it looks like they should be split apart, right? They're like mini books, but no, there are 80 full-length well, not fully books. Some of them are excerpts from larger works, and others are just assorted essays and short stories. Others are, of course, poems. We have uh, a couple plays, if I'm not mistaken. So let's get down to it, shall we? So, and they're numbered from 1 to 80, which I love as well. Giovanni Boccaccio, Miss Rosie, Mrs. Rosie and the Priest, Body tales of pimps, cuckolds, lovers, and clever women from the 14th century Florentine masterpiece, The Decameron. That I know of. Gerard Manley Hopkins, one of my favorite poets, as Kingfisher's Catch Fire. Considered unpublishable in his lifetime, the Victorian priest's groundbreaking experimental verse on nature's glory and despair. Ah, Anon, uh, a book by Anon. The Saga of Gunlog's Serpent Tongue. Scandinavian verse. Ranging across Scandinavia, England, and Ireland, a Viking Age epic of two poets in doomed pursuit of Helga the Fair. I actually read the Elder Edda quite a while back. I read half of it in Norway, which inspired my epic at the time. Thomas de Quincey, on murder, considered as one of the fine arts. The provocative early 19th century essayist casts a blackly comic eye over the aesthetics of murder through the ages. My oh my. Friedrich Nietzsche. I love, 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 love Nietzsche. I actually have the full length, uh, the unabridged version of Thus Spake Zarathustra. It's awesome. Aphorisms on love and hate. The iconoclastic German philosopher's blazing maxims on revenge, false pity, and the drawbacks of marriage. John Ruskin. Traffic. The radical Victorian art critic's excoriating defense of dignity and creativity in a world obsessed by money. Yeah, couldn't be more right about that. Bu Songling, Wailing Ghosts. These delightful miniature tales of macabre hauntings and monsters and magic tricks are classical China's greatest stories. I just, I, I'm so attracted to literature and just the arts in general. Um, that do not originate in America. I don't know. I, I can't explain it. I just love it. Jonathan Swift, one of my favorite satirists, A Modest Proposal. Swift's ferocious landmark 18th century political satire on how to solve a famine in Ireland. <laughs> Another book by Anon. And where the author's name should be, there's just a picture. Three Tang Dynasty poets. Oh, I love it. Love, love, love the Tang Dynasty poets. My two favorites are Wang Li and Tu Fu. Pastoral lyrical verse evoking the rural landscapes and peoples of 8th century China from three of its finest poets. Speaking of poets, Walt Whitman, On the Beach at Night Alone. The visionary 19th century American poet celebrates nature and the human spirit in these verses from Leaves of Grass. Kenko. A cup of sake beneath the cherry trees. Moonlight, spring blossom, a woman's hair, a medieval Japanese monk reflects on idle moments and life's fleeting joys. Baltazar Gracian, How to Use Your Enemies. 
A 17th century Spanish priest shrewd maxims on using guile and pragmatism to succeed in a dangerous world. Goodness knows we need that. Ah, one of my favorite romantic poets, John Keats, The Eve of St. Agnes. The romantic poet's most lyrical, enchanting verse on myth, sensuality, dreams, and superstition. I think that's kind of debatable. I, I kind of prefer the Lamia in that sense that the book is referring to. Thomas Hardy, woman much missed. Moving, elegic verse set in rural landscapes, penned by the grief-stricken Hardy after his wife's death. It's, the title makes a lot of sense in that regard. Oh. Guy de Maupassant, femme, femme fatale. Four sparkling 19th century tales of Parisian high society and rural life from the father of the modern short story. Indeed. Femme fatale, indeed. Marco Polo, not the swimming game, travels in the land of serpents and pearls. The intrepid Venetian traveler's observations of a 13th century India filled with lavish jewels, chaste princes, superstitions, and naked armies. I like that title. Naked armies. Might use that. Suetonius. Caligula. Oh boy. The infamous Caligula. The original biography of the murderous, crazed, and incestuous Roman emperor Caligula, who pronounced himself a god. <laughs> yeah, he did. Apollonius of Rhodes. Jason and Medea. A heroic tale of love, anguish, and the golden fleece from the ancient Greek epic Argonautica. Hence, Jason and the Argonauts. Robert Louis Stevenson. Oh, la la. Stevenson's chilling Victorian Gothic novella about decaying aristocracy, vampirism, and tormented love. Apparently in literature, sometimes the best kind of love is tormented. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. The Communist Manifesto philosophy. This revolutionary summons to workers transformed the modern world and still shapes millions of lives today, indeed. Petronius, Trimalchio's Feast, a billingly comic portrait of the vulgar Trimalchio and his debauched, drunken Roman banquet from the outrageous Latin masterpiece, the Satyricon. Outrageous, indeed. Johann Peter Hebel, how a ghastly story was brought to light by a common or garden butcher's dog. <laughs> Sparkling miniature German fables, sketches, and tall tales, including Kafka's favorite story. Ah, oh, the beloved Hans Christian Andersen, the tinderbox. No, it's not about tinder. Andersen's bittersweet fairy tales propelled their troubled author to international fame and revolutionized children's writing. Ah, Roger Kipling, very creative person. The Gate of the Hundred Sorrows. Opium dens, curses, ghostly tombs, these sinister tales of Imperial India made Kipling's name as a writer. This it did, indeed. Dante, Circles of Hell. A terrifying depiction of sin and eternal damnation from Dante's Inferno, the medieval epic that revolutionized the Italian language. Yes, indeed. And uh, Inferno was just one part of the Divine Comedy. Henry Mayhew of Street Pieman. The matchless chronicler of Victorian Londoners observes everything from surprise pie fillings to a balloon ride over the city. <laughs> Around the world in 80 pies. Hafez, the nightingales are drunk. Oh, one of my favorite Persian poets. Spiritual, sensual verses on love, heartbreak, and celebrating life's small pleasures by the great 14th century Persian poet. Fun fact, many people spell his name with an I. Not sure why they chose E here, but, you know, not one to judge. Geoffrey Chaucer, the wife of Bath. Expedience. One of the most famous Canterbury tales casts a satirical eye over sex and marriage in the medieval age. Yeah, that it does. Chaucer captured that image perfectly in the Canterbury Tales. Michel de Montaigne. De Montaigne. I, I sincerely apologize. As a logophile, I love words to death, yet I can't bloody pronounce this one correctly. Michel de Montaigne. Yeah, I'm not going to make myself look an idiot any longer. How we weep and laugh at the same thing. Glittering essays by the Renaissance master of the form, exploring contradictions in human thoughts and actions. 
Thomas Nash, The Terrors of the Night. Demonic horrors and spirits dreamt up by the most exuberant, inventive prose writer of Elizabethan England. Ooh, chilling. And speaking of horror, boom, Edgar Allan Poe, The Telltale Heart. Horrifying tales of mystery, sickening madness, and buried bodies by the master of the macabre. That's debatable. I think he's one of the masters. I'm not sure if he's the master, but, you know, to each their own. Mary Kingsley, a hippo banquet. The fearless, pioneering Victorian female explorer describes dodging elephants and fighting off a leopard with a stool in Africa. Would definitely love to know how that turned out. Jane Austen, the beautiful Cassandra. Austen's riotous early stories of drunks, poisoners, and prison breaks written for her family's entertainment when she was a teenager. <gasps> Jane Austen's juvenilia, looking forward to that. Anton Chekhov, Gooseberries. Chekhov perfected the short story as shown in these three moving miniature dramas of love, dread, and lies. Best friend and I were having a talk about Russian, uh, classic Russian authors. They really knew how to master the novel, the form of the novel. And uh, same goes for short stories. I love their short stories. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, another one of my favorite romantic poets. Well, they are gone, and here must I remain. Dreamlike, poignant verse on passion, torment, and the resplendent landscapes from one of the first romantic poets. Yes, indeed. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Haha, see, I don't feel so bad about pronouncing this correctly because I bet you many people had trouble with this at first, so I don't feel completely bad. Sketchy, doubtful, incomplete jottings. Love incomplete and uncollected jottings and works in general. The great 19th century German thinker's musings on self-deceit, superstition, art, and ambition. Charles Dickens, The Great Winglebury Duel. Two rollicking tales of scoundrels and ne'er-do-wells from the sketches by Bowes that launched Dickens' career. Don't get me wrong, I, he is a, very accredited to his craft. I, I respect him as an author, but uh, I could never get on board with his novels. I tried, I tried, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. But, but I, I do love his work, though, I do. Herman Melville, The Maldive Shark. Dark, nightmarish sea stories and poems inspired by Melville's adventures around the world's oceans in a whaler. I'm trying to collect more of his poems. I love his love his poetry. Read the story about the Essex that inspired Moby Dick. It's one of the best stories I've ever read in my life. Elizabeth Gaskell, the old nurse's story. A ghostly child roams the Northumberland moors. White fairy tale, wild fairy tale characters gather at a strange party in these two Victorian Gothic tales. Oh my. Nikolai Leskov, the Steel Flea, an uproarious romp of one-upmanship and drunkenness from the 19th century Russian comic genius. Ah, some light humor. Honoré de Balzac, the atheist's mass. Two devastating stories of faith and sacrifice from Balzac's panorama of 19th century French life. Buried in the same place as Oscar Wilde and Jim Morrison. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, The Yellow Wallpaper. This horrifying semi-autobiographical feminist story of imprisonment and madness scandalized 19th century society. Very revolutionary in its time, I must say. Oh, one of my favorite Greek poets contemporary, slightly contemporary, C.P. Cavafy, remember body. Moving, sensual verses on nostalgia and desire by the masterful early 20th century Greek poet. Speaking of great Russian novelists, Fyodor Dostoevsky, the meek one. Based on a St. Petersburg news report, Dostoevsky's searing tale of a man who drives his wife to suicide. My God. As if the world's not horrible enough, but... News is news. Gustav Flaubert, A Simple Heart. Flaubert's most famous short work meditates on the unexamined, futile life of a servant and her beloved parrot. Almost reminds me of one of Mozart's operas. <laughs> Nikolai Gogol, The Nose. 
Russia's great 19th century satirical absurdist shows what happens when a man wakes up with his nose missing and illustrates the folly of boasting. Samuel Pepys, The Great Fire of London. Originally written in code, Pepys' diary includes his unforgettable eyewitness account of the 1666 fire. Wow. Talk about dedication. Edith Wharton, The Reckoning. From the great writer of the turn of the century New York, two devastating portraits of lonely widowhood and an unconventional marriage. Major oof. Henry James, The Figure in the Carpet. James' troubling late Victorian mystery of an unsolved literary riddle and sudden death has inspired endless speculation. Wilfred Owen, oh, my favorite World War I poet, oof, alongside Siegfried Sassoon. Anthem for Doomed Youth. The great First World War poet portrays firsthand the horror, devastation, and futility of the trenches. Oof. Definitely troubling. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, my dearest father. I would like the complete collection, actually, of these letters, of these correspondence. Entertaining, touching, and sharp-tongued letters between the great 18th century composer and his mentor father. Plato, Socrates' defense. Sentenced to death for corrupting the youth of ancient Athens, Socrates, Plato's teacher, founded Western philosophy. And uh, I have read excerpts from quite a few Greek philosophers, but not completely well-versed on them. Looking forward to it. It's a learning experience. Christina Rossetti, Goblin Market. The pioneering 19th century poet's best known and most darkly imaginative verses on love, death, and loss. Oof. Another a non-book. Sinbad the Sailor. Adventures of, a sh of shipwreck, colossal beasts, and fantastical islands from 1001 Nights. Who wrote that indeed? Who spoke it aloud? Sophocles, Antigone. The tragedy of Oedipus's daughter, a wise, fearless heroine who shuns society's laws from the master Greek dramatist. Definitely important. Ryanusuke Atu Akutaga <coughs> Ryanusuke Akutagawa, The Life of a Stupid Man. Japan's modernist master explores family, art, and the fear of madness in exquisite autobiographical pieces and a short story. Love Japanese literature. Leo Tolstoy, How Much Land Does a Man Need? A parable of a Russian peasant's bargain with the devil, considered by James Joyce to be the world's greatest story. Giorgio Vasari, Leonardo da Vinci. I love books on art, I really do. The first art historian explores genius and madness in Leonardo and other celebrated Renaissance artists. Definitely looking forward to that. Looking forward to all these. Oscar Wilde, Lord Arthur Seville's Crime. Wilde's supremely witty tale of dandies, anarchists, and a murderous prophecy in London high society. Like I said, some of these are excerpts from longer works. Others are standalone pieces. Yeah, others, uh, yeah, of course, essays, short stories. It's a nice little sampling, a nice little tease from everyone. Shen Fu, The Old Man of the Moon, a moving 19th century account lost for many decades of a Chinese official's all-consuming love for his wife. Aesop, ooh, some fables, The Dolphins, the Whales, and the Gudgeon, composed by a slave in Greek antiquity, some of the most ancient, sharp-witted, and mysterious stories ever told that they were. They do earn that. Matsuo Basho. Oh, I love Basho's work. I love his haiku. Lipped too chilled. Japan's celebrated Buddhist poet balances the smallness of humanity with nature's epic drama in these magical 17th century haikus. Emily Bronte, speaking of poems, the night is darkening round me. Bronte's most passionate, powerful poems on death, nature's beauty, and the passage of time. 
Joseph Conrad, tomorrow. Set in a desolate English port, Conrad's spare, savage, turn-of-the-century story of lives haunted by the sea. It really is one of the most haunting terrains known to humanity, the, the endless sea, just like outer space. Richard Hakluyt, The Voyage of Sir Francis Drake Around the Whole Globe. The great propagandists for Tudor sea power depict the voyages of the famed explorers who mapped the world. Kate Chopin, a pair of silk stockings. I know of this one. From Louisiana's remote bayous to its gilded cities, five startling stories of awakening by one of Finsley's America's most daring writers. Charles Darwin, gotta love him. It was snowing butterflies. Exotic creatures and unexplored terrains populate Darwin's account of the Beagle's momentous voyage. I've yet to buy his complete works as well. I'm very interested in his views. I think I have their complete works, and if not, I need it. The Brothers Grimm, the Robber Bridegroom. Drawn from German folklore, dark, fantastical fairy tales of wicked deeds, gruesome punishment, and just rewards. <gasps> Love this. He's, he's one of my favorites. One of my favorites, Roman poets. Catullus, I hate and I love. By turns rapturous, erotic, and despairing, this astonishingly modern verse tells of an ancient Roman poet's all consuming infatuation with one woman. Mm -hmm. Speaking of poets, Homer, Circe and the Cyclops, ah, excerpts from the Odyssey. Ancient Greek myths from the Odyssey, telling of battles with deadly beasts and a beautiful enchantress. D. H. Lawrence, Il Duro, sketches of scorched landscapes, peasants, and wild spirits from Lawrence's travels in early 20th century Italy. Il Duro. I don't know what that means in English. Catherine Mansfield, Miss Brill. Vanity and creeping loneliness permeate these three short stories by the modern master of the form. That she was. Oh, another one of my favorite Roman poets, Ovid, the fall of Icarus. Enduring myths of vengeful gods and tragically flawed mortals from ancient Rome's great poet. Sappho, come close. Sensual, sun-soaked verse on love and the gods in ancient Greece from the poet named the Tenth Muse by Plato. And rightly so. She is one of my biggest inspirations, poetry-wise. Ivan Turgenev, Cassian from the Beautiful Lands. These haunting accounts of rural Russia and its downtrodden inhabitants helped to abolish serfdom in 1861. Well, piece a history there for you. Virgil, he wrote the Aeneid, or the Aeneid. O cruel Alexis, the pastoral verse steeped in wit and nostalgia from one of ancient Rome's greatest poets. Love love his work to death. H.G. Wells, a slip under the microscope. Disturbing prescient stories of human conscious and conflicting desires by the pioneer of science fiction. Too bloody right, man. Herodotus, the madness of Cambyses. Weaving factual account with colorful myth, the father of history tells of the psychotic Persian king and his fateful death. Well, if he's psychotic, I mean, death is the way to go, right? Speaking of Siva, yeah, I love this book. I, I actually have the complete version of this, but I, I love that they included this in it. Four medieval Hindu saints approach sex and death through riddle and enigma in this mystical devotional poetry. Love, love this verse. And last but not least, the last book by Anan, the Dhammapada. Glad they included this book as well. Ancient aphorisms on endurance, self-control, and perfect joy, widely acknowledged as the Buddha's own teachings. Eighty books, my friends. My goodness gracious, Great Balls of Fire. This is going to be a fun, fun read. And kind of like Ian Curtis, sometimes when I read, I quote-unquote work. I, I don't read just for pleasure. Sometimes I'll... I, I, I won't forcefully seek out inspirations for my own work, but it helps. 
excuse me, it helps to gather a better understanding. But anyway, all of those are included in this, the Penguin Little Black Classics. And these were one to two pounds each in, it, uh, in England. So, um, yeah, they're just one or two a piece. It's, it's amazing. Uh, you get a great sampling out of every single one of these. I, I can't stress that enough. And here's the thing. A great humorist once said, books are not like computers and cell phones and whatnot. They, they have no low batteries, they have no downloading issues, there's no Wi-Fi connect, uh, connect, uh, connectivity issues, nothing of the kind, no technological issues. You just open it and everything is there in front of you, everything on the page. I think that is the most beautiful <laughs> viewpoint of what books stand for and the very existence of books. They are important. They are deeply important. If you are not a heavy reader or a reader in general, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. Please start. It's never too late. It's never too late. This is going to be a fantastic read. It's taking my sweet time, of course. It's ranging from, like I said, history to criticism and drama, from fiction and nonfiction to philosophy, uh, and drum and everything in between, and of course, lots and lots of glorious poetry. So here's to you, Penguin, thank you so much for this. I will cherish this for the rest of my life, as well as <laughs> the rest of my books in my um, increasingly growing collection. It's abnormal at this point. It's like a, probably a fraction of the size of the library from Beauty and the Beast, for goodness sakes. So, get yours today, folks. 80 volumes, samplings, teases, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, yeah. So thank you very much, Poetry Love Buzz. If you like what you have seen, please subscribe to my channel. I have plenty of content to offer. There are plenty of similar unboxings. There are book reviews, interviews. Um, and then, of course... Uh, jam sessions, uh, videos of me reading essays, published poems, a cappella sessions of poems that have been turned into songs, and much, much more. So, uh, again, I thank you so, so much for taking the time to view this entire video, if you've watched it. <laughs> I do appreciate